This is Jenna. Jenna's on a cliff. Jenna's now gonna jump off the cliff. Bye, Jenna. Now, Jenna jumped off a cliff. Are you gonna jump off a cliff? Probably not, right? And why? The reason is that you don't have the same threshold as Jenna. Your threshold is higher than Jenna's to jump off a cliff. But what if Jenna was your best friend? What if everyone in the world was jumping off the cliff? Will you then jump off the cliff? What if you're jumping off the cliff into water? Well, you knew you were gonna survive. What about that? All these things might change your threshold and might make you willing to jump. And this is the power of the threshold model. The threshold model in essence says that people are likely to do an action when a certain percentage of the population, their threshold, actually does the action. Then they're likely to copy them. Now let's look at a more realistic example. Now let's look at riots. When thinking about riots, our gut instinct says that participation should be based off individual values or political beliefs. Surprisingly, this only scrapes the surface because individual motives are actually determined by group behavior and it can follow a very cascading effect. Now let's look at an overly simplistic model showing a domino effect. Here's our simple model. Say we have five players. We have an instigator, and then we have player one, two, three, and four, and they each have specific riot thresholds, meaning the number of people in the riot that would require them to join as well. So the instigator would join the riot if there's zero people involved, because they're very passionate, as you can tell. The first, the first player would require one person. So if the instigator joins, and then the first player sees that they're joined, they would join as well. Now there's two people involved in the riot, and our second player has a threshold of two, so they would join as well. Our third with a threshold of three, they would join, and our fourth, seeing four people, would join as well. So this showed a cascade of a domino effect, or a bandwagon effect as we know it. However, if we slightly change our model, where we replace player one to have a threshold of two, making them less angry, now we'd see that our instigator would still join when no one's involved, but our riot would instead be reduced to one person causing a ruckus instead of a group of passionate people because this player two would not see two people involved, so they would never join. They would never join, they would never join, they would never join. So we can notice in this threshold model that a tiny change in the group can have a huge impact. Now we said this model is overly simplistic, and it really is for a couple of reasons. One, riot thresholds aren't constant. In our previous example, the rise threshold of one person might always be one, so you always see one person. This isn't accurate. For instance, in some rise where they're more passionate, their threshold could be lower or higher. Additionally, if they see a friend, that might cause them to think, I'm more likely to join the ride if my friend's in it versus any random person. And this will have a huge impact in social networks, which you'll see after the math break. But first, a math break. We had a linear sort of sequence of people. But that's not fair. Let's assume we have a uniform distribution of population. So we have an equal number of instigators, an equal number of oneers, or people who need to see one person, right? Equal number of twoers in a riot. And then we take a sample size of that for our actual riot. We can then do some basic math using Vermeulean distributions and see there's a 37% chance our riot or a group of or a sample will never have an instigator. So we'll never get started. And there's a 14% chance that even if our riot had an instigator, it didn't have a one -er. So we'll never actually progress. Which means just by doing these two simple things, we can see there is a 51% chance our riot never really becomes big. And this is part of the reason why riots are still really rare, even though the cascading effect exists. So let's assume that there was an instigator and a riot does take off. We can now use this model to find the equilibrium point of threshold distribution. So this line here, our f of x, would be the threshold line. And this curve would be able to show how many people would show up according to their threshold. So first, let's look at R of T, which would be the amount of people at a riot for the first timestamp. If there's this many people here, we can see that a new threshold is triggered, and so people with this threshold will now show up, causing an increase in numbers in the riot. And this will occur until we reach our equilibrium point, which is where growth usually stops. You may be wondering then what this side of the graph would be. And we can think of a basic example of take the American Revolution. If people are irrelevant to the cause of the revolution, or even on the British side, if they see this many people at a riot and they realize that America might be winning, they would join the riot anyways to be accepted by the new governance, per se. So that's why there's this growth once again. 
Now, when Granovetta was creating this theory, he wasn't thinking about online or social media. He didn't know about a world like Facebook or Twitter where he can be connected to hundreds and thousands of people across the world at a snap of your fingertips. That being said, Granovetta's principles still apply. You can still have cascades. And Bailey on in 2011 did a study and found that cascades do happen, though they tend to be a bit rare. But Facebook and other online platforms have an advantage, which is on these online platforms, you can have a higher influence threshold. And you can think there are more people who are actually going to protest than there are in real life. And this is because in these online areas, you have a smaller group. You're almost in what we call an echo chamber or a bubble. And so if your echo chamber bubble has everyone protesting and saying, hey, we're gonna protest, this is unjust, you're more likely to think that there's gonna be a riot, and you're more likely to riot. Now, this can have some downsides. If your echo chamber is from people all across the world, then in your local area, when you go and try to protest, there might be no one there, which means to small, local, uncoordinated riots. And that's what Peter Vita found out in 2018. Now, to avert the problem that Peter Vita found out, we do planned riots. Not in the sense that the government sanctioned, but that they're organized. You're like, we're going to meet at this time on this day to protest. And it's the way it has always been from things like the Boston Tea Party, to the Civil Rights Movement's March in Washington, to even modern day things like the Women's March and the BLM protest. This organization is what prevents us from having these coordination problems. One aspect that Granovetta did not consider was that of these anti-conformists, you might even call them hipsters, if you will, people who are less likely to do an action as the threshold goes up. For example, here, you have a line which shows how many people are participating in the riot and activity. However, once you reach a certain threshold, some people will be like, you know what, I no longer want to conform, and will back down. This is almost an idea of it being too quote-unquote mainstream. And this becomes a really big problem when looking at online areas. In fact, when we look at online things, as a paper published in 2019 says, these present anti-conformists, just even a couple of them, maybe even 5% of the population, can almost completely flip the percentage or the domino effect that's going on and cause it to swing in the other direction. In fact, this is what some people believe has such a big effect with the Trump 2016 election and the presence of what we call trolls. And this is definitely an area that needs to be studied more and is an open problem when looking at the threshold model and how it applies to social networks. Overall, we've demonstrated that Granovetter's threshold model is still extremely relevant in explaining collective behavior today over 40 years after he published it. However, when using his model to analyze protests that are organized online, like ones today commonly are, there are a few complications that, ar that arise, such as echo chambers, coordination problems, and anti-conformists. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned something.